Hello friends! So I am Avery Wickham and I'm here to talk to you guys today about insects. Alright, so I'm doing this as part of the Ames Insect Initiative, which is through the Iowa State Insect Zoo, which is where I currently am. And so the Ames Insect Initiative is an initiative that I started to make Ames a more insect friendly place. And so part of that means teaching you guys all about them. All right, so before we get started, an insect is anything with six legs, three body parts, a head, thorax, and abdomen, a pair of antennas, and then an exoskeleton. And so that exoskeleton is very important. And so it's like a suit of armor protecting the insect. So an insect is part of a larger group of animals called arthropods. So all arthropods have an exoskeleton. So it includes insects, but also things like scorpions, tarantulas, millipedes, centipedes, crabs, lobsters, those are all arthropods. All right, but today I'm just gonna be talking to you guys about insects. And so you might be wondering, Avery, why do you care so much about insects? Why are you talking to me about bugs? That is because insects are very important for our environment. And there is a lot of them. All right, so I have a hundred M&Ms here. And this represents all of the animal species on Earth. So every animal species is included in this hundred. So if I were to account for all of the vertebrate animal species like us or anything with a backbone, so you know, cats, dogs, giraffes, amphibians, fish, I would remove five. And so those are all of the vertebrates, which is usually what we think of when we think of animals. I were to remove five, five, if I were to remove 20, we are left with 80. So 80 out of 100, 80%, this is how many animal species are insects. 80% of all animals are insects. Isn't that crazy? And if we were to add five more to this pile, all right, so now we have 25% over here, 75% over here. 25% of all animals are beetles. So one out of every four animal species is a beetle. That is a lot of beetles. That is a lot. So there are more species of ladybugs, which is a beetle, than there are mammals. There are more species of longhorn beetles than there are of birds. There are more species of weevils if you've never seen a weevil, that's okay, but it's this. It has a really long snout. It's okay if you've never heard of them. But there are more species of weevils than there are of fish. So there are a lot of beetles, which is really cool because beetles are awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and move these to the side and show you guys a beetle. And so it is in this jar of dirt. You might not see it originally as a beetle because it is in its early life stage. So just like how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly through complete metamorphosis, a lot of other insects do that, including beetles. So if we were to get him out, whoa, he's very dirty. But this is a beetle larva. So complete metamorphosis has four stages. And so it goes from an egg to a larva, this guy, to a pupa, which is basically a giant bug sleeping bag into a beetle. And so as you can tell, this guy is very large. So we have beetles in Iowa. So we have grubs or beetle larvae, but they do not get this big, unfortunately. And so he lives in the dirt for two to three years. And while he's there, he makes a lot of these. So these, my friends, are not M&Ms. This is frass, which is a fancy word for poop. And so this poop is actually really important though, because this guy, let's see if I can find one. He eats rotting wood. So when a tree dies, it's not very good for us because we like trees and we don't really like dead trees. And there's a lot of nutrients still left in that tree wood, in that bark. And so this guy will go ahead and eat it and then turn it into frass, which is like vitamins for the earth. So this frass is the reason that we are able to grow anything. So he makes really good soil and he is very important. I also think he's quite cute. All right, so if I go ahead and bury him, I will show you guys what he turns into. So after he hatches from an egg and spends two or three years like this, he will turn 
Dun, da, da, da. Into a Hercules beetle. And so I'm going to show you a lot of cool animals. Unfortunately, this beetle is the only one that will be dead. So I said that the larva lived for two to three years. Well, the adult beetle, this guy, whose name is Archie, Hercules beetle, he only lives two to four months. So that's a very short time, which is very sad. So the first thing that you're gonna notice about him is that huge horn. So only the males have that horn. So if I show you a female, this is a girl, Hercules beetle. She does not have that horn. So that horn is used to fight other males. And so they live in trees, and so he'll actually open up his horn and then pick up the males and then throw them off the tree in order to get a girlfriend. All right, so if I were to go closer on that orange fuzz, you guys would be able to see how fuzzy he is. So it's on his horn, it's on the back of his abdomen, it's underneath him. And so that orange fuzz plays a very important role. So beetles are pollinators, which means that they move pollen from one flower to another. And so when we usually think about pollinators, we think about bees, maybe even butterflies. However, beetles were the original pollinators. They were the first pollinators on earth. And so they are very special. There's also, like we said, a lot of beetles. So beetles do a lot of pollinating. Pretty cool. All right, so now we know that there are a lot of insects, but you still may be wondering how that really affects you. In fact, it's hard to name something that we use every day in our lives that doesn't revolve from insects at some point or another. I mean, take these M&Ms that I showed you guys earlier. The chocolate from these comes from the cacao plant, and that can only be made, those beans, if their flowers are pollinated. And their flowers have to be pollinated by this really small fly called a biting midge. So we wouldn't even have M&Ms without insects, which is super weird to think about. All right, so we know that beetles are really good for the soil, but what about other insects? So I'm going to talk to you guys about cockroaches. And I'm sure if I already said the word cockroach, you guys are thinking of the six invasive species. So six cockroaches are considered to be invasive because they can live in human housing and we don't want them there. But that's six out of 4,500 species. So if I were to go back to the M&Ms and show you, it wouldn't even be one m and I'd have to cut this up in half and then in half again, and even then it would be too big, but it started crumbling and it would take just too much time. So trust me, it's a very, very small percent. And so we should probably think about all the good that cockroaches do. So cockroaches are decomposers, so they will eat leaf litter or food that we throw away and we no longer want. And then they turn it into really, really good soil, just like the beetles. So here in Iowa, we actually have one native cockroach. It is called the wood cockroach. And it cannot survive in human housing and it would much rather be outside. And so cockroaches are also good for the environment, not just for decomposition, but also as food for other animals. And so it might sound weird for other animals to eat cockroaches, but cockroaches are really good for a lot of animals, including humans. So yes, as the bug person, I'm now telling you that we should be eating bugs. So you might think that's weird, but if we go back to the beginning, when I was talking about insects being arthropods, other arthropods include crab or lobster. So they both have that exoskeleton that's made from the same material, and so if we're already eating crab and lobster, eating insects is not different at all. In fact, if it helps, you can even think about insects as being like miniature land lobsters. And they taste good too. So ants, their flavor is sometimes compared to lemon or honey. Mealworms taste like sunflower seeds and crickets can be seasoned to kind of taste like anything. So they can be pretty tasty in a good snack or meal. And so 80% of all countries in the world eat insects every day. So here in America, we're the weird ones for not eating insects, especially when they're super good for the environment and good for us. They're very high in protein. So there's actually a local cricket farm in Ames trying to change that. And so it's called Jim Eats Crickets, and she sells her crickets even in like high V's now in Ames. So if you wanted to try out eating insects, I highly recommend you start there. Okay, so now we have established that insects make delicious, tasty treats. So what do you think they do in nature to not get eaten? So let's pretend that we are very hungry birds and we spot a very tasty cockroach. 
And so if we go near and go really close and then get ready to eat it, when all of a sudden we hear a So we're thinking, oh no, there's a snake nearby. We gotta get out of here. I'm not hungry anymore. I'm worried about being eaten. So bird flies away and all of a sudden we are left with not a snake, but a cockroach. And so that's the Madagascar hissing cockroach. And he found out that you don't have to be venomous like a snake is, you just have to pretend to be venomous. So that is a very smart trick that they have learned. And so when one animal pretends to be another, that is called mimicry. And so they are mimicking a snake and they make those sounds through their spiracles, which are those little black dots on their abdomen. And so all insects breathe through their spiracles, those little holes, but cockroaches found out that if they force air in and out really fast, it makes that hissing sound that scares away other animals. So they're from Madagascar, which is a small island off the coast of Africa. And so there are a lot of venomous snakes there. And so that is a very good trick for them. And so another example of a cockroach mimic are the domino cockroaches. So while they look more like game pieces to us, they're actually pretending to be a six spotted tiger beetle found in India. So the beetle they are mimicking is poisonous, meaning that when other animals eat it, they get sick. So by pretending to be an animal that other animals can't eat, it also doesn't get eaten. And as you can see, I can hold these guys, I can play with them. They're kind of fast, but again, they are completely harmless like most cockroaches are. All right, so now we know that mimicry is when one animal pretends to be another, but when an animal pretends to blend into its surroundings, that is called camouflage. So I have with me some masters of camouflage, and I'm gonna go ahead and show you what they are one by one. And I'll give you guys a few seconds in between me telling you what they are trying to camouflage as and you seeing them. So kind of figure out what they are camouflaging as. And here is the first one. This one's pretty easy, I will admit. All right, so it is camouflaging as a stick. So this is the Vietnamese walking stick. So pretty thin, small head, long body, pretending to be a stick. So that way other animals won't eat it. Pretty basic. It does have a second form of um, protection. Whereas if a bird came up and tried to eat it and grabbed onto its leg, this guy could actually pop his leg off. Pretty cool. And I say this guy, but this is probably a girl because these guys actually reproduce through parthenogenesis, which is a very big word, but basically it just means asexual reproduction or basically cloning. So when they lay eggs, they are all female and they are genetic copies of themselves. They do have boys sometimes, but it's pretty rare and usually it's through parthenogenesis. All right, so I'm going to grab the next guy. All right, so try to guess what this one is camouflaging as. A little trickier. So this is the Australian walking stick and she is trying to pretend to be a dead leaf. You can see how she looks kind of crumpled and shriveled. And when I blow on her, she actually sways back and forth like a leaf would. However, if pretending to be a dead leaf does not work, she can also, if I start touching her abdomen, she will curl that up and pretend to look like a scorpion because she is from Australia and in Australia they have scorpions which are venomous. I think that is pretty cool. And if neither of those work to defend herself, she can also, I'm putting on a magnifying glass, have all of those little prickly spines. So that's her little head, hi, she's kind of bald. But all of those spines work to stop her from being eaten because I don't know about you guys, but I would rather have a snack that is very smooth rather than a very pokey. 
This gives rise to their second name, the prickly stick insect. So I'm now going to grab our third walking stick with probably the best defenses of the rest. And so you guys can go ahead and guess what she is pretending. A little trickier. Also, I say she because of, you see this big spike on her back abdomen? So that's not a spike at all or a stinger like people think. It is her ovipositor. So ova means egg, posit means to put, that is her egg putter. All right, so this girl is the new guinea spiny walking stick and she's pretending to be bark on a tree. That is why she's very thick. And so in nature, they will hang out on the trunks of trees and try not to get noticed. And again, just like the Australian, she is very, very pokey. So you can see all those spines on her back legs as well. So all of the walking sticks I've shown you guys live in trees or on plants and eat leaves. And so that is why their eyes are pretty small, antennas are pretty wide, and that is why they're really good at climbing. If you see their legs, those two little things sticking off their feet are called tarsal claws. So the tarsi are used to grab a hold of things. So if I were to put her upside down, she's totally fine. All right, so I'm going to show you guys another walking stick. This is the last walking stick I will show you guys. And we're gonna do it a little bit differently because otherwise it is very easy to guess what they are camouflaging as. So as you can tell, a leaf. However, these are one species of walking stick, even though they look very different. They are the same age. However, one of them is a boy and one of them is a girl. And so take a few seconds to kind of guess which one you think is the girl and which one you think is the boy. All right, have your answers. So if you said that this one was the female, you would be correct. And so as you can tell, the girl is much bigger than the guy. And that is because she has a very important job of laying eggs. So she has an ovipositor, just like the other one does. And so actually, these guys are the New Guinea, uh, not New Guinea, sorry. These guys are the jungle nymph walking sticks found in Malaysia. Jungle nymph walking sticks. And the girls lay the world's heaviest insect egg, which is pretty crazy. So she's not actually full grown. When she is, she'll be a lot bigger. Yeah, so the boys look like this and the girls look like this. Pretty cool, I think. So everything that we have talked about so far has been an insect. At the beginning of this video, I told you guys what every insect has. And so here's a quick quiz. Everything here is something that an insect needs to have except for one. So which of these is not correct? All right, so you should have said wings. So some insects have wings, but you don't need wings to be an insect. All right, so an insect that does have wings is the spiny flower mantis. So here she is, and you see on those back wings, there's that circle design. And so that spiral is actually another form of camouflage. And so she is pretending to be a flower, but it's not so that way predators will not see her. It is so that she will attract other insects. And then it's kind of like getting her food delivered to her because she eats other insects. Those are her gorgeous purple eyes. So because she is a predator, she has to have very good vision to see other animals. So whereas the walking sticks did not have good vision because it does not take good vision to eat leaves, she has very good vision. So praying mantises have those raptorial forelegs, as I'm sure you guys know. And so they do that to be able to reach their food and grab it very, very fast. These are oftentimes seen on the internet because they're very, very pretty and people think they are one of the prettiest insects and I agree. So she's actually able to flare her wings. So here's a different one that always has their wings flared. So there's two parts to their wings. 
the ones with the swirl patterns, and then underneath, the yellow and clear ones. So they can fly with their wings, but usually they do not because they are so heavy. They will use them for displays. So here it is without the magnifying glass. And as you can tell, she is pretty small compared to me. So the spiny flower mantis is not found in North America, but we do have two mantises that you can usually find in the summers. So the North Carolina mantis is brown and pretty big. And there is also the Chinese mantis, which is not from here. It still has a really important role in the ecosystem. So uh, these praying mantises are really good biological controls for other insects that might get too big in population. So by eating bugs that we don't want, they have a pretty good job. So, yay. So, so far I've shown you guys beetles, cockroaches, walking sticks, and praying mantises. And all of those have different roles in the ecosystem, whether it's decomposing matter and turning it into really good soil, like with the beetles, whether it's food for other animals with the cockroaches, or whether it's eating other insects that we don't like, like the praying mantis. So the next one I'm going to show you is not an insect, but I think really important for you guys to see and learn about. Okay, so this is Rosie the rose hair tarantula. So as you can tell, Rosie has eight legs, so she is not an insect. She is an arachnid. So tarantulas are a special type of spider, and so that it means that they are very hairy. As you can tell, she is very fuzzy. And also that they do not spin webs to catch their food like other spiders do. So I'm showing you guys Rosie because I know a lot of people are scared of insects and spiders. And so mostly spiders, and that's totally fine, but I want you guys to know that I've been working at the Iowa State Insect Zoo for three years, and I hold tarantulas almost every day, and I have never been bitten. That is because I'm way bigger than she is, and she knows that she does not want to hurt me, as I do not want to hurt her. And they are just really gorgeous. So all of that hair has a purpose. So she can actually hear through that hair. And not only can she hear, she can sense vibrations and she can even protect herself with her hair if she had to. So right on her back, that is her abdomen, that little kiwi shaped thing that my finger is over. And so there's special hair back there called urticating hair. And so if I was bothering her, she would take her two back legs and she would kick off some of that hair. And it's pretty scratchy, pretty itchy, almost like barbed wire. So if it got in my skin, it'd be pretty irritating. As you can tell, she is not doing it right now because we are best friends. So I know it might be very tempting if you don't like spiders to squish them or kill them or scream at them because they are scary, but I can guarantee you they will not hurt you. And also they are very, very good for the environment. They eat other insects that we might not want. So she has a very important job. Thank you so much, Rosie. All right, so thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you learned a lot about insects and enjoyed having a sneak peek at my friend Rosie here. Um, please let me know if there's any questions.